Well, glad to have you all here. Uh, we're going to jump right in. Again, we have a lengthy or a lot to talk about this morning. If you have been with us over the last couple of months, you know we have been marching through the Genesis account. Genesis 1, we're in Genesis 2, where we're taking a couple of weeks to look at the, the marriage contract or the first marriage to help us better understand what that looks like and uh, uh, what God's original design was. So let's just dive in. If you have a Bible, open to Genesis 1 and 2. We're actually looking at two separate verses, uh, two separate places in the opening chapters of Genesis. And uh, it, it, it's on your bulletin. You can follow along there. We have the words on the page or on the screen here. And so we invite you to uh, join us. Let's pray. Lord, show us yourself this morning within your word. Show us ourselves within your word. Show us our Savior within your word. Make the book come alive this morning, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, I uh, was sharing at a uh, 50th wedding anniversary not that long ago, uh, something I discovered from a linguistic conference in England years ago where it was being debated the difference between the words completed and finished. When something is completed and when something is finished. Oxford Dictionary struggles with trying to differentiate between the two. But at this particular conference, there was an Indian American who, uh, his name was Soon Sherman. And he gave the most satisfying response to the guests who were participating in the debate. He said this. He says, when you marry the right woman, you are complete. If you marry the wrong woman, you are finished. <laughs> and when the right woman catches you with the wrong woman, you are completely finished. <laughs> See, there's this understanding about marriage. That there is a design that it's supposed to be. That if you follow that design and if you live within the parameters of that design, it's good and you're complete and, and everything's great. But then when you go outside of that design, we all understand that there are some ramifications and there are some uh, things that happen and there are some things that are, 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 we struggle with outside of that design. And so that takes us to the question of what is the design, which is something we have been looking at over the last couple of weeks. It brings us to God's design. The original principles that are laid out in the opening passages of Scripture, as God talks about design of lots of things, he, remember, in the opening texts of Genesis, he gives us all the things he designed, heavens and earth, the stars, the animals, the trees, all of those things. And yet he sets aside a little bit more detail when it comes to the subject of marriage, when it comes to the subject of the man and wife and the relationship that they have with one another. And so that's why we're pausing and taking a little bit more time to talk about that design. Last week, we talked, in fact, that marriage was, first of all, it was made by God. And remember, even the title that we talked about last week, we said marriage is good. A very simple title, but that was it. It, it is. It was designed to be something that was good. And then third, it served as the prototype of God's great love for his people. And so all throughout scripture, he talks about the, the bride and the groom relationship between he and humanity. Well, out of, out of, and so this week we continue that discussion. And, and before we dive into that, I just want to acknowledge a couple of things. First of all, anybody here have a perfect marriage? Okay, don't, do, don't raise your hand because you'll be lying in church, okay? Right, right? The reality is, is that when we talk about the things that we're talking about today, we're talking about the perfect. We're talking about the garden. We're talking about the ideal. And we all fall short of that. And so I know that the subject, actually, when we start talking about this subject, is very uncomfortable for some people. And because of the nature of the relationships that we've had, and this very intimate relationship, the most intimate relationship we can have. God designed it that way. And, and oftentimes there's hurt and there's, there's struggle and there's not the ideal here. But keep in mind, we are all fallen. So let's all just admit that we are all fallen and we are all imperfect. And if it's not marriage, it's something else. Okay, so let's all just be on the humble plane here. And then secondly, as we come into that, we remind ourselves that, again, we're looking at things that we can possibly glean to bring back an insert 
into our fallen nature. All of this, again, points us to our need for the gospel that redeems, that restores, and, and the, the future restoration where, where all things are made new. So let's all stand right there and, and just sort of pause and say, there are some things that we'll be saying this morning that might be a little bit challenging for some or, or, or might rub the wrong way. But we're all fallen, so let's acknowledge that. And then secondly, when we come to this this today, I want you to understand this is not a Valentine's Day message, okay? This is not your seminar that's three steps to the perfect marriage, okay? That's another seminar. That's another place, and and those are all good, and and they're sometimes even within the context of the church. But we are actually, in our discussion of marriage, ultimately pointing away from us and our relationship And going to go and point to the beauty of Christ himself and his deep, deep love for the church. So don't don't come thinking that this is just a, you know, you've got all these colloquial sort of stories and these uh, different things that we're going to illustrate with and humor galore. That's not it. Actually, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. So again, you you know, throughout this whole series, right, I've told you, warned you, (laughs) we're, we're diving deep. And so we're going to do that again this morning. So let's go to our text. We go to uh, Genesis chapter 2. And let's start in verse 18. It says, Then the Lord said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now what I want you to do, if you're following along in your outline, right there in the paper that's been given to you, I just want you to circle that, highlight, put an asterisk, something, underscore, um, that, that word, helper fit. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave the names to the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Underline that again. So we see a phrase that is used two times in this description of the marriage institution. Helper fit. Say that. Helper fit. Okay. Now, some of you, like me, when I was a child, grew up on the King James Version. Anybody know what the King James Version here is? Help meet. (laughs) You you know, it's not something we use in our vocabulary today. I grew up in Sunday school actually believing that this meant that Adam was shy and he needed help meeting Eve. (laughs) So God was the helper to meet Eve and, and sort of smooth the relationship over. Not what it means. Also, the other idea is when, when we start thinking about that, I mean, in the modern context, when I, I told people I was marrying my wife, I said, I found the woman of my dreams, I'm going to get married. I didn't go around saying, I found my helpmeet. Everybody would have looked at me and, what? What, what is that? So, so oftentimes, we don't even really understand what this, uh, this word is about. But I, I think modern translations do a better sort of uh, translation to help us understand. But even at that we actually need to go back to Hebrew language to really understand this because let's go and look at that word helper. Now, what this does here is oftentimes people see that as pejorative for the woman, right? The the woman's the helper. It's Batman and Robin. She's Robin. He's Batman. You know, it's the sidekick. And, and, you know, Batman, he's the main thing. And then there's the the, sort of the side person to to run the errands and take care of certain elements. And, and, And really, that's something that needs to be rediscovered all over the globe as to what this word means. Because this idea of subjugation of the woman in the marriage relationship has been perpetuated over and over again because of words like helper that have been misunderstood. But I want you to understand this word helper in the original context is a a powerful, powerful word. It is, in fact, a military word. Do you understand? A, a, a powerful military word. Let me, let me tell you how it would be used. Suppose I have my battalion, and my battalion, as I'm fighting a battle, we're outnumbered 10 to 1, and we are about ready to be overrun completely. I would sort of send a, a sentinel to go and, and run to another battalion and say, we need a helper. <laughs> Right? A helper, somebody that will bring, it's bringing in the reinforcements because we're about ready to go under. And so it's something that's strong. Oh, yeah, the reinforcements come in. Now we'll have victory. So there's this very powerful, powerful term. And by the way, it's not just used militarily, 
It's used for God himself. Do you understand that? I I mean, the word is Jehovah Azer. Say that with me, Jehovah Azer. That is God is my help. The idea for the nation of Israel is that they would be overrun as well and that they couldn't do anything without the help of God himself. So that's a powerful term. Let's just look at a few verses where where this is used in scripture. You see in uh, Psalm chapter 46, verse one, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our time of trouble. That's not the sidekick. That's not the errand boy. That is the one who delivers the people of Israel when they couldn't do it on their own. Look at Isaiah chapter 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. There's that word azer again. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 121, 1. I lift my eyes to the hills, and where does my help come from? I could go over and over with all kinds of verses about how God is the powerful strength and the helper of Israel. In fact, here, a choir sings for us often, come thou fount of every blessing. I'm not sure what verse it is, but it, we say, here I raise mine. You're supposed to sing that when I say that. Here I raise my There you go. That's better than me, huh? (laughs) Right. What is that? Hither by thy help I come. And people sort of scratch their head and go, what is an Ebenezer? I'm raised. What is that? You know what that is? Ebenezer. Where's the word? Help. It means the stone of help. Samuel says God was the stone of help in our situation. He's the one who who, who rescued us in our dire straits. You see, uh, women, we need to understand that you are a stone of help. Married or not, God created you to be a powerful reinforcement. It's a very powerful, powerful term. And we need to reinvent that or, or redefine that in the modern era. So, women, you know, at dinner tonight, just remind your husband, I am a powerful stone, (laughs) a stone of help. And husbands, you can say, well, you're an Ebenezer. Well, that's probably not so good. Ebenezer Scrooge ruined that for us, right? Charles Dickens, uh, he, he ruined that. But the idea here is, indeed, you are the stone of help. And if you've been married, you know, for any time at all, and, and uh, you, you know that, men, we know that. And women know that. We, we all, I, I think of my own relationship. Uh, man, uh, I, 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 my wife is the stone of help. She's the reinforcement. You know how many times, some of you have been in ministry for a period of time here. If you've been in ministry for any period of time, you want to quit. <laughs> it's, just part of the, it's just part of the package. I don't know what happens. Uh, somewhere along the way, you said, I'm done with this. I, I wanna, uh, my thing is when I'm done, I want to go be a truck driver because then I don't have to deal with people, right? I can just drive my truck. And, and so I say, I want to be, and so many times I say, oh, I, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. And my wife is the one who comes in. The reinforcements come in <laughs> and say, what are you talking about? You know that you're calling, you know this. And, and she just encourages me. And, and, and I wouldn't be here today without the reinforcements. And, and many of us men, whatever we do, we would not be here today without our reinforcements. And so loved ones, I get a lot of thank yous, right? Uh, I, I got it for, for the work that we do in the ministry. You know, a lot of that is the reinforcements. I wouldn't be here without the reinforcement. That's the idea that is given here, the very strong and powerful reinforcement that it comes in the woman, married or not, you are a powerful reinforcement. I put number one on your outline, jot this down. God made Eve to be a powerful reinforcement. Jot that down and talk about that at the dinner table tonight. What does that mean? A powerful reinforcement. But second thing I want you to notice about this helper is that she is made from the side of Adam. This is a very strange thing, but this is what the Bible says here, is that she's made out of his side. It says in verse 22, it says, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, I heard the story of a Sunday school boy who was listening to this, enamored by this, right? This idea of a woman being made out of the side of a man, and he was talking about it all week, this concept of of what's that like? And, uh, you know, one day he is out and about, and he came home with a a, a bellyache. And his mom said, you you know, what's wrong? What's the matter? He said, I think I'm having a wife. 
you know, made out of the side. This idea that he takes this and, and says, you know, that what, what is this? How, how, do, how do we sort of process this? Now, of course, we know that's not a medical condition here in the 21st century. I hope we don't think that anyhow. But in the, here it says that indeed he is made or she is made out of the side. And I love what Matthew Henry, uh, how he describes this. There's a great theological richness to this. He, he writes this. He says, not made out of the head to top him, not made out of his feet to be trampled on, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. And notice, I want you to notice this also. God, how did God made, make Adam? Out of the dust, right? Puts them together. Now, does God make another Adam out of the dust? No, he doesn't say, hey, I've got one dust here and I'm gonna make Adam and, and, and I'm gonna make another dust over here and I'm gonna make Eve. No, he takes her from him. The same flesh and blood, the same bones. She comes from Adam. She can't be thought of any less than or any more than, but she is equal. I, I like to equate it this way. The best way that I can think of it is I like to meddle with plants uh, out in a garden in my patio. And, and every now and then I, I cut off a branch or cut off a certain part of the plant and I replant it. And, and, and it begins to grow, right? Right? And pretty soon it's indistinguishable between the first plant. <laughs> they're, they're all, it's from the same stock and completely indistinguishable. That's what God is doing here. He's not designing a different plant that is a different DNA. It's the same DNA, but it is different, and, but it, it is equal. Pretty soon, you know, those plants, they grow together and you go, what one was the original one? And so again, there's this a clear sign of equality to work cooperatively in an equal partnership in the relationship of marriage. See, the subjugation and the lowering and the mistreatment and the disempowering of women, I believe is a clear act of the fall. Why do I believe that? Go over to chapter three, right at the fall, and what's the consequence of the fall? Verse 316, it says, he shall rule over you. <laughs> if you're ruling <laughs> over women, that's a clear consequence of the fall. And, and that's the nature of the world that we live in, and I get that. And yet, I think the biblical model here is the idea of equality when it was first formed, when the first marriage is relayed or uh, established. If you look at the beauty and the creative process, you cannot help but see an equality and a partnership that walks side by side and shares together instead of one that rules over. I put number two, jot this down. God made Eve as an equal partner. God made Eve as an equal partner. Now, let's go back to, we, we talked about helper there and this side. Let's go back to help meet or fit helper or help helper fit. So let's look at that word fit. I think that's an important word to sort of guide us in our discussion here on marriage. The word fit. Uh, if you look at that word in the Hebrew, it is literally translated as in front of, the other side of, or opposite. Okay, can we say that? In front of, the other side of, or the opposite. And, and, and one Jewish scholar, a Hebrew scholar, actually says that this word is best used when we think about a river and the opposite river banks. All right? It's in front of, it's opposite to, it's a side, uh, uh, on the side of or the other side. So when we think of riverbanks, the marriage relationship is the riverbanks, all right? And I find that, that analogy to be helpful or that imagery to be helpful. But first, I want to talk about the idea of opposite. When we have two opposites, God did not make another Adam. Do you understand that? It wasn't Adam and Adam. Or it wasn't Eve and Eve. He made an opposite. It was a man and a woman. And any Hebrew who was reading this at this time would have said, oh, of course, I know what this means. It is a concept of, uh, of different. It's opposed. It, it, it is counter. One uh, commentator says this word fit is called the counterpartner. Counterpartner. It is an opposite in a variety of different ways which if you go to the original design, 
we, we see that the marriage relationship that God established in its original root was man and woman. So design principle number three, jot this down. God made a man and a woman as counter partners. They're not only equal partners, but they are counter, different in makeup. They are not a carbon copy. They are going to be different. Now that is the original design. And you say, Pastor Chad, this would be a good place to talk about LGBTQ issues, right? And the various things that are happening around the globe and, and the different things that are happening within our church and the different understandings that we have towards the marriage relationship. And I would say, yes, it would be a good place, but I have a better place coming up, all right? Here, we just have to give it a little side note. But it co come later this year, I have a series called Crash. And it's not just this issue, but a lot of different issues where the things that we read in bi the Bible don't line up with our culture. And we want to see what do we do as Christians when those don't line up? Because the church hasn't always responded very well to those things. And so we want to take a deeper look on a broad view of several different things, about four or five different areas where, where we're wrestling as a church. The, the body of Christ is wrestling with some of these issues and so let's talk about that later as we get, there's a, a perfect place, uh, uh, probably closer to the summertime where we will pause and, and, and take a look at those. So for right now, for our purposes, let's just talk about the counterpartners that we have here, all right? But second, I want you to think about the rivers uh, of marriage that include boundaries, okay? They include a closed system that defines a river, the best way to illustrate this, years ago, I was, uh, not years, several years ago, I was just in Jinja uh, in Uganda. It's Lake Victoria. It's the largest lake in Africa. And right here, there's a spot where you can go where the Nile River begins. It goes all the way from the Mediterranean Sea, well, actually from this lake, all the way into the Mediterranean Sea. And what happens is Jinja, or this uh, Lake Victoria, is this massive, massive uh, it almost looks like an ocean when you're standing on it or next to it. You can't sometimes see across it. It is so great, so wide. But then you see it starts, the river starts to flow. Water starts going and it narrows and it narrows and it narrows and it narrows. And pretty soon you have a well-defined river that is set apart by two banks. You go from massive down to a river. And, it, and by the way, the Nile is not the only one. <laughs> There's other rivers that are shooting off of this, this, this lake. And really, that really helps us to understand and define the marriage relationship. I like to say in our marriage uh, ceremony that I do, there's this part where I say, of all the men and all the women in the world, God has set apart two of his children to serve him together, right? Think about that. Eight billion people on this, in this world. You know, there's more uh, women than men right now, so uh, yeah, I don't know what the percentage is, but there's four million men to choose from and four million women to choose from. And God sets apart out of this massive lake. He says, now you two are going to flow together and you are going to be set apart for a unique relationship that I have for you. And so this idea, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter uh, 2, verse 24, this is later confirmed. It says, therefore, a man shall leave, who? His father and mother and hold fast to his wife. He's going outside the big lake of all the different choices, and it says, oh, he's holding fast to one. And this is defined, and this is the relationship that they go forward in. And, and I always say also, and I, I, make, uh, I, I write the vows. I always tell people when they come up to my office for premarital counseling, I say, do you want to write your vows? And they say, yes, we want to write our vows. And then I say, well, I get to write your first vows. <laughs> and, and I always say, you have to go through my vows to get to your vows. Because oftentimes the vows are like, I promise to play video games with you forever. And they really don't have a whole lot of meaning. And so I, I, I say, you, we have to get to the real vows that are in scripture. And one of those vows is, will you have eyes and mind for one woman or one man for the rest of your life? What am I doing? I'm banking off the giant lake and saying, we're going now to a narrow stream. We're going to a river where you are clearly defined. And one more idea from the bank 
analogy or this idea of being fit is that while banks are set apart and they're opposite, the water that flows between them is shared, isn't it? I mean, you drive over the Pasig, Pasig River. I drive over it several times a, a week. And when I look down, I don't go, oh, that water belongs to the left side and that water belongs to the right side. No, I actually look and say, oh, how did that water get so dirty? But the, the reality is, is it's, it's, it's water, right? It's not, we look down at the bridge and we say, that's the Pasig. It's not defined anymore as two separate banks. If you look from the sky and you're flying in, you should fly in over what? The Pasig, not the left side or the right side, not one bank or the other bank. It is now shared together, and the water that goes between them is shared together. And this is what the text says. Go back to verse 24. It says, they will leave a man, the father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. They become one. Now, a neat little thing here that many people overlook. I want you to pay close attention to this because this is a great discovery. If you look at the therefore, when we say there's a therefore, I say the therefore is therefore a reason. You have to go to the previous text. What's the previous text? We talked about it last week. Remember, Adam is writing that love song to Eve. At last, remember that song? And, and, and he, he gives all these words. She's flesh of my flesh. She's bone of my bone. Now, it says therefore, she's flesh of my flesh bone of my bone, and she set aside, this is the great rib reversal, where she comes back into the flesh, right? She is set aside from Adam, and and this is the imagery that is given here. It's a twist on words in the original Hebrew, right? She is set aside as a separate flesh, and then in marriage, you become one flesh again. Adam loses his rib, and then he gets one back, (laughs) It's, and we don't want to say that it's a pejorative thing like you're the rib, but it's actually a, a, a one thing that shows the, the great intimacy and the closeness and, and the theological ramifications of really becoming one flesh together. In fact, in Ephesians, Paul says, when a man loves his wife, he loves his own flesh. We could say that of the women. When a woman loves her man or her husband, it is like loving her own flesh. They, they come back together and they are reunited mystically into one flesh. This is where Martin Luther, uh, father of the Protestant Reformation, he was, he was a monk and celibate for much of his life until the Protestant Reformation occurred. And then he said, marriage is a good thing. And so he uh, decided to marry Catherine von uh, Bora. And uh, his, his pet name for Catherine von Bora was Katie, my rib. <laughs> you know, it sounds like, well, my rib, what? No, it is really an endearing term that you are fundamentally a part of me. I, I can't sort of pull my rib out anymore. Only God can do that. But you are so united with me. We're, we're such partners. We're one flesh. It's a, it's a remarkable uh, idea when we think about how intimate that is. In marriage, man and woman, they are bounded together, heart, body, soul, in mutual giving and total oneness. When one hurts, the other hurts. Should be. When one's joyful, the other should be joyful. When one is struggling, the other is struggling. When one wins, when one loses, all of these things, it is not isolated two banks, it is one river that is flowing together. Again, in my vows, another thing I make them say, and I don't know if they mean it or not, but I make them say it. I say, I I tell the couple, everything I am and have is yours. You have to say that to your partner. Everything I am and have is yours. It's one now. The, The water is shared together. Why? Because you can't distinguish whose is whose anymore in the marriage relationship. See, the theology of marriage includes this mystical uniting of two people. Number four in your outline, jot it down. God made marriage as rib replacement. (laughs) God made marriage as rib replacement. You might need to write a note there of what that means because down the road you might go, what is he talking about here? But it's the idea of the rib coming back in, that flesh becomes one together. And parenthetically here, this is where we go to the gospel. This is where we go to the New Testament. When we think of this verse 2, chapter 24, Paul uses this verse to describe the relationship that we have with Christ. 
In fact, look, at if you go to Ephesians chapter five, verse 31 and 32, it says this, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. What, 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 this is what we just heard. Paul is just quoting verbatim what is here in Genesis chapter two. And he says, and the two will become one flesh. And he says, this mystery is great. And then he says, oh yeah, by the way, I'm speaking about reference to Christ and the church. What is he saying? He's saying Christ and the church are becoming one flesh. It's that, that imagery of the groom and the bride in our union with Christ, loved ones. We are melded. We are bound together in mutual giving, in mutual oneness. The New Testament declares over and over again, you are one with Christ. It declares over and over again, you are part of the body of Christ. That when we come to Christ, we were alienated, we were separated. And then, oh, there's the, the, the coming of the groom. And now we are brought into Christ fully as one. Do you understand the consequences of that? Do you understand the ramifications is that? Think of this. I mean, everything that is Christ is yours, loved ones. That's, that's a biblical thought. Everything that is ours is Christ. And by the way, we married upwards here. <laughs> you think about that. We, we think about people who marry for money. You know, they don't have anything. And, and then they, they, I'm looking to marry upwards. I, I'm looking to get a good deal out of this. And so they marry up where we use that term, loved ones, when it comes to Christ, we married upwards. Everything that is his is ours. Everything that is ours is his. As that old Annie Flint song said, we, out of the infinite riches in Christ, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And we think about even in the New Testament, John chapter 14. He says, I go to prepare a place for you that where you go, I may be with all, you also. You know what that is? That's a, that's a marriage phrase right there. That's what they did in ancient times. That, everybody who was reading that would say, that's a marriage. Oh, he's talking about he's the groom, we're the bride. Why? Because in ancient times, it was the, the, the couple would be betrothed, but they, the marriage wasn't consummated, but they were committed to one another. And then the groom would go away. And he would prepare a house and prepare everything for the bride so that when she came, she would be comfortable. And when the house was completed, he would go back and get the bride and bring her home and say, here's your house. <laughs> everything that is mine is yours. The scripture talks about eating at the same table with Jesus Christ. He shares the table. It talks about this idea of co-heirs with Christ. It says that we share in his glory. Paul even says this idea, we have something called imputed righteousness. Some people have misaligned this and thought, oh, he makes us righteous. He gives us a little bit of righteousness here and there. No, imputed means we are on the same bank account. He puts our name on the same bank account of righteousness that he has. Now, how much righteousness does Christ have? Perfect righteousness. And he says, everything that's mine is yours. You are declared, that's why the Bible says you are declared righteous. You can't do it on your own, but when you're married to Christ, ah, this oneness that we become, what a glorious thing. And even 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, let's no, let no one boast, for all things are yours. This isn't added money in your bank account. This is the idea that everything that is Christ's is yours, and that's all things. I was telling the first service that, you know, we're not much of an amen kind of a church, but this is an amen kind of a message where we're saying that, that we, when we become one with Christ, this marriage, this unity of Christ, we're, we're given so much. And by the way, everything that is yours becomes the Lord's. You, you don't have much, by the way. You know what you have? Debt. Big deal in marriage counseling. Some of you here have been in my marriage counseling. What do we always talk about? We talk about debt. <laughs> because sometimes when people are in my office and they're getting together and they're so in love and they're getting ready to go and then we start talking about finances and all of a sudden it comes to light. There's a great deal of debt. Somebody has great debt and, and there's a little bit of tension there. We'll, 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 and I say to the person, I say, that debt that is his now becomes yours. Well, well, that's not fair. No, 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 no. You gotta, everything that is mine is yours and everything that is yours is mine. The debt becomes yours. You need to understand that. 
If you're marrying up and you have a lot of debt, I say to the guy who has, you know, has, has got all the money, you know all the debt down here. It becomes yours, right? Loved ones, the debt that you have and you are a debtor, it all goes to Christ. It becomes his. And in fact, this is where it says in Isaiah chapter 53, he says, he took our sorrows. It says he took our infirmities. He took our transgressions. He takes our sin. Why? Because we're his bride. And he takes it all. Everything that is his is mine and everything that is mine is his. Loved ones, we indeed married up. All of this goes back to the marriage vows. And listen, when my wife confesses to me, everything that is mine is yours and yours is mine, that's one thing. And it's a wonderful thing. I, I won't, I won't, uh, you know, I love sharing that with my wife. But when Christ says it, oh, loved ones, do you understand the gravity of that? Do you understand how much he loves us? Do, do you understand what that means for you? What a wonderful love he has. Let's move on. We have one more area that we need to look at, and we go all the way back to Genesis chapter one. It takes us to the first instance where the marriage relationship is given. At the end of the chapter in verse 27, it's called the Edenic Commission. Can you say that? Edenic Commission. Why is that important? Well, it's the first command that's given in the Bible. Would you say the first command that's given in the Bible is something that's important? Yeah, I would say so, okay? So we wanna look at this and it deals with the marriage relationship. So go to verse 27, it says, God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Those words are important and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on earth. Now, if you were with us a couple of weeks ago, we talked about image, made in the image of God. Remember that idea, the graven image, do not have any graven images. What are the images in that day? They are the idols. And God is saying, you don't have any graven images because there's only one image. What's the image? It's the one that I made. I carved it out of the dust. I made it out of the clay. It is the only image, and all the other ones are phony. There is only one image that represents the transcendent, glorious God, right? And that is you. That is the humanity. And so now, he says, he gives this command. He says, go fill the earth with that image for the glory of God. You were created as the image to represent the glory of God, of the transcendent God in the local area. In fact, go over to Isaiah. I love this verse. Isaiah chapter 43, verse seven. It says, everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You are created, you are formed, you were made for what purpose? His glory. That's it. That, 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 stop. End of sentence. That is the foundational purpose for which you were made. And then we have here, after that is established, that you are made for his glory, God says, now, in this partnership, this counterpartnership that you have, you are to reproduce that glory so that there will be idols celebrating the glory of God all throughout the earth. It's not good that there's just one area. I want my glory in every nook and cranny, every part of the earth, so that my glory spreads like a blanket over the entire earth. His fame is what he's going for, his glory. And that's what stands here at the base law. This is law commandment number one. Before the Ten Commandments, before the establishment of the Mosaic Law, before the New Testament, before Jesus gives the Great Commission, he says this counterpartnership is to create more images for my glory that goes around the world. Number one commandment. Notice we're going to see the commandment repeated not, not that much later. Go over to Genesis chapter nine, verse one. And this is what we call the Noahic commission. We have the Edenic commission. Now we have the one that he gives to Noah. What is the Noahic commission? It's the exact same thing as the Edenic commission. Remember, the earth has been devastated and there's one family that's left. It's Noah's family. So God says, I, I need to remind you of something. I told Adam this. I, I need to remind you of this. He says, and God blessed Noah. That sounds familiar, right? God blessed them, the first couple. And he said to his sons, and we'll say daughters as well, 
be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There it is, the image of God, the glory of God is to go throughout the earth. And then you just go two chapters later and we see how miserably they failed. You go to the, what's called the Tower of Babel. Remember that story? Where all the people sort of come together and they build this tower. Listen to what the scripture says. It says in Genesis chapter 11, verse four. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for the glory of God. Does it say that? No, the glory of God's out of it now. They've lost it. We make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be what? Scattered all over the face of the earth. Notice the two things that happen here. Number one, no longer is it about the glory of God. Number two, no longer is it filling the earth with the glory of God. It is now staying local so that we can make a name for ourselves. Marriage commitment, Edenic commission, uh, comm commission and Noahic commission already forgotten about. Just two chapters later. So God spreads them to different parts of the world. He scatters them to fulfill the commission. See, the opening verses of the history of humanity, this is so important, loved ones. We are told we are sent ones. And the counter partnership that you have in the marriage relationship, and this is it, whether you're single or, or are married, is to accomplish this first task. And, and here's the thing. This is what's really important when we apply this, is so many people come to the marriage institution and this is where I say, you know, we have certain classes to talk about the three steps for a perfect marriage, but we always come looking laterally. I come just looking for love. I come just looking for meaning. I come just looking for satisfaction, for somebody to take care of me. I come for all the things for me. But how many of us go into the marriage relationship and say, this was established? for God's glory <laughs> and then start using it as such trying to train our children with such when we, we, we make little idols we go hey you're an idol for the glory of God and so we become people who are equipping our families for this glory and uh, glory of God husbands and wives we need to start seeing our relationship through this lens talking to your children about it you, you know it's okay to say hey you know what you're a little idol not the American idol or the Philippine idol or the singing kind of idol, but you are the idol that brings glory to God and represents his glory on this earth. Last thing, jot it down. God made marriage to fill the earth with his glory. God made marriage to fill the earth with his glory. Talk about that at the dinner table. What does that mean for your family? What does that mean for your children? What does that mean for your relationship? to reinsert that back in, that it's all for the glory of God. And by the way, one final parenthetical thought on all of this. Now, the Edenic commission is the opening command. You know, wanna know what the final command of Jesus is? The Edenic commission. It's all bookend. The first thought is go fill the earth with the glory of God. The last thought is go fill the earth with the glory of God. Go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Look at this very, very closely with me. And it says this, it says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. What does this remind you of, heaven and earth? Genesis chapter one, verse one, right? <laughs> but in the beginning, God who has all authority, remember that word, the all powerful God, he has all authority, he created heaven and earth. And Jesus is saying, he, he's pointing us back to the garden saying, that's me, that's me, I was there, I did that. I have all authority over all of this. And then you know what he does? The next, very next thing he does, he gives us the Edenic commission in another way, in another phrase. Notice what he says. He says, go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations. Go fill the earth, the first commandment in Genesis is the last commandment of Jesus. And the last commandment in the day of Jesus of the rabbis was the most important. Remember, we've said that. If they come towards the end of their life after everything they would learn and they would say to their followers sort of the most important thing and they would say, my learning of all of my life accumulates in this. Here is my command for you. And Jesus happens to be, go make disciples of all the nations. Fill the earth with the glory of God. 
And then by the way, he also talks about subduing. Look at the next thing he says. He says, in baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. You're gonna subdue. You're gonna bring dominion. You're going to bring the rule of the kingdom of God into the world. The first commission is the last commission. But I want you to notice, here's the last wonderful thing about all of this. He doesn't say you're gonna go by yourself. He actually inserts himself into it. He says, yeah, I'm the creator, the one who established this institution. I'm the one who established the whole earth. And then he says, now I am going to insert myself as the groom to go with you. Look at the last words. We often overlook these. He says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know what that is? That's marriage language again. I take you, my church, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, to love and to cherish to the end of the age. He says that about you. That's what that is. He's affirming the commandment and then he's affirming his commitment to go with you. He says, you aren't going alone this time. I am going with you. I'm gonna take this, I'm partnering with you. I will be the groom. We go out together to fill the earth with God's glory. And he participates with us in this great commission. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm the one with you. Everything I have is yours. Everything you have is mine. And I will be the partner that goes alongside of you for the glory of God. And I will succeed where the first Adam failed. Don't you love that? Loved, loved ones, do you know how much you're loved? That we sang in our first service this morning, Oh, How He Loves Us. And I don't know if you know that song. It's very simple. But as we were just singing that, Oh, How He Loves Us. Oh, How He Loves Us. Oh, How He Loves Us. Oh, the thought of this came to my mind. And I thought, you know, indeed, I love my wife tremendously. But that, doesn't, that pales to the love of the husband to the groom, his bride. His love for you is profound. It is so meaningful. See, loved ones, marriage was designed and purposed for much more than just two couples who fall in love and live happily ever after. It was designed to show you God's great love for you. The love of the groom towards the bride. Do you, do you, do you understand how profound that is? How great that love is? That's another amen in, in Pentecostal circles. <laughs> it is a powerful, powerful thought. When we think of all the effort that scripture goes in into the first pages of scripture to declare his great love for his people. May we see that and, and may we follow that wonderful design and purpose of marriage with our own spouses. But here's the thing. May we love our groom and come back because of his great love. He loved us first. And we say... Everything I am and everything I have is yours. That's, that's what he wants in the relationship with you. He loves you so profoundly and he just wants us to respond by saying everything I am and everything I have is yours. We are united. We are one with Christ. I don't know that there's anything more powerful in scripture than that thought right there. Lord, thank you for the beauty of the marriage relationship that points us to an amazing love that is incomprehensible. I can't get my head around it, Lord. That you, the one who stood in the heavens and earth and has all authority over all of that, finishes by saying, I will have and hold from this day forward till the end of the age to me, to your church. Help us to know how deeply loved we are. And in response, help us to come back knowing how faithful and how loving you are with our total commitment to put ourselves and, and unite ourselves in the love that you offer us. We ask it in your name. Amen.